How's everybody doing? Good to hear. Glad to see you. A little poem to start the service today, and I'll um, read it as a prayer. So please bow your heads. We walk by faith and not by sight. No gracious words we hear of him who spoke as no ever spoke, but we believe him near. We may not touch his sands inside, nor follow where he trod, yet in his promise we rejoice and cry, my Lord, my God. Help then, our Lord, our unbelief, and may our faith abound, to call on you when you are near and seek where you are found, that when our life of faith is done in realms of clearer light, we may behold you as you are in full and endless sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing.
sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. Right now, right now I'm losing back.
Good morning, everybody. Hey, people showed up while I was up front here. I thought it was going to be about four of us today, so I'm glad that a few of you decided to come in late, or right on time, right on time. We come to the time of the service where we're lifting up our prayer requests and praises, and uh, so I invite you during this time, whatever's on your heart, Go ahead and give that to God during this time. And if you want to come forward, we can form the Garden of Prayer. And uh, we can do that as well today. So I invite you, wherever your heart leads you, whatever you need to do today, please either come forward or pray where you are. Give it all to God. Let God have it. And then open your heart and mind that you're ready to worship God today. So let's go to prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today and we do thank you for the blessings that you pour into our life. Lord, we pray as we go through this time together that you remind us of your goodness over and over again. The world tries to rob us of that. Help us to remember the good things, those inward things, those special things of love, of hope, of forgiveness, of justification, of mercy. These things do not fade over time. So we give you thanks that today we can come and praise you all over again for all those good gifts you give us. And of course, we want to give you thanks for that greatest gift you've given us, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For the life that he lived and the service that he gave, that he followed you in faithful response, even to the point of death, and we thank you that at that point of death that you did not let death be the final answer, but instead you raised Jesus from the grave and you've given us hope that death is not the end for us either, but that we can go and be with you. We know that today that you are busy and you are working on a dwelling for us in heaven, a wonderful place where we can spend eternity with you. We thank you again for that wonderful gift. But Lord, we pray that you be with us today. Help us with our aches, with our pains, with our sorrows. Strengthen us and give us good hope that that day is coming and will soon will, will arrive. And now as the children of God, we wanna pray the prayer that Jesus Christ himself taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, amen. We invite you during this time, we're going to take a moment and have the offering. And I always forget until we get right at this very second that I'm supposed to say something intelligent about the offering. And, and if you all know me, I'm not that smart a guy, so I just have to kind of come up with stuff. But I was reminded, um, uh, what day was that that we got attacked by all those kids? Friday? Friday. We were out in the driveway, and it was Hunter's birthday party. And Hunter was afraid that this many kids were going to show up, you know, the grand zero. And so he was, he was quite thrilled when two arrived, and then three, and then four, and then five, and then 10, and then 12, and then I don't know. And um, Teresa, in her infinite wisdom, decided to use, this is where offering comes, I swear. And Teresa, in her infinite wisdom, decided to buy water guns. She got like 40. And I said, what are you doing? And she says, they're a dollar a piece. And I'm like, that's not the point. <laughs> now every one of these kids is like triple loaded and ready for bear. And so as you can guess, I got a little wet. But I think I gave as good as I got. And so today we come and we are reminded that sometimes even a dollar can make a big impact on somebody's life. You know, just a few bucks made, made the kids thrilled. Just a few bucks can make an impact on anybody's life today. So we invite you, let's give of the offering. May the offering be given and received. <laughs> Boy, I don't know what was going on on the back row back there, but I hope it involved a lot of money. That was, that was great. So, we come to the table today, and we are reminded of the grace of Jesus Christ all over again. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of the evening, in the midst of the night, Jesus Christ took time to give us something that has lasted for thousands of years. And so today I come and I share with you the tradition that's been passed on to me. And that tradition is this, that during the course of the meal, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. In a similar manner, after the meal was over, Jesus took a cup. And he said, this cup is in covenant. It will be sealed with my blood. Take, drink. And so we come to the table to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup and to proclaim the saving grace of our Lord and Savior until he comes again. This is a gift from God to the people of God. And the people say, Amen. Let us stand and sing.
Amen. You may be seated. I've been looking for my Bible all day. I tell you. What kids we have? What kids? Ah, oh, we got more than that. Young adults? We could bring young adults. I'll wait. You can set by L. She's safe. I promise. You're straight out of kindergarten. Is that what your shirt says? I like that. <laughs> LaShawn, I like that shirt. <laughs> I may have to get one of those. I never graduated kindergarten, but I'm sure if I had gone, oh, Teresa has gone. Oh, there she is. If I had gone, I think I would have passed kindergarten. Aren't, don't you set farther forward? What are you doing way back there? You couldn't walk down the aisle? Yeah. Hey, do you know, speaking of walking down the aisle, I have an announcement. I'll save it for later. So um, Ezekiel 37 talks about a valley of dry bones, dry bones. So I'm telling you a scary story, but then, but then we'll have a nice song, and the song will make it all okay, all right? So there we go. So anyway, there was this valley of dry bones, and Ezekiel went there, and he saw him just laying on the ground. It was the bones of people long since gone. And Ezekiel said, where's the hope? There is no hope, Lord. These are dry bones. And God said, oh, Ezekiel, preach to those bones. And Ezekiel said, what's the point? They're dry. They're, they're done. They're, these bones aren't any good. And the Lord said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I mean it. Preach to those bones. And he began to preach to him. This is where the ghost story starts. And it gets a little scary because as he's preaching, the bones begin to rattle. They do. And then they begin to form together. They do. They do. And then sinew and muscle begin to build around them. They do. They do. And they take form, and skin covers over them. It does. I swear. It's in the Bible. It must be true. And then Ezekiel says, Lord, What's going on here? And it, the Lord said to Ezekiel, I'm about to breathe into these dry bones and bring them back to life. Watch this. And he did. And they jumped up. I know. It's scary. And then they began to praise God. So as long as we have breath in our lungs, what's the point of Ezekiel 37, do you think? What should we be doing? Eat chicken. No. I, I, you can. What, what did the bones do when they first got their first breath of air? What did they begin doing in this story? Yeah, they did jump. But then after they jumped, what did they do? Came alive. They did come alive. I don't know if I told this story right. Hi. Praise God. All right. So there we go. You did not. And so our job in life is to do what? Praise God. Praise God all the time. So sometimes we can do that in song. So I have a fun little song that we're not going to make anybody sing today, but I thought we'd listen to it just for fun. Okay? So if it's ready, Sean, let's see what this does. And you can do the motions if you want. Thank you, crack them dry bones. Crack them dry bones. Word of the Lord. Connected to the. around them bones gonna walk around them bones and bones gonna 
around, hear the word of the Lord. It's to the neck bone. Come on, connect it to the... Bones connected to the knee bone. Heard of the Lord. Hey, I like that song. You know, that reminds me of something else. Do you know what's coming in just a few weeks? Easter. <laughs> yeah. That is a few weeks. Easter is coming. But I was thinking of Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School. So if you like singing and seeing songs like that, then no, no, come on. Then you should come to VBS and invite your friends, okay? Invite your friend. Are you willing to invite one person? Just one. One. One? No? How about a half? No, no, well, all right. Well, we'll do our best. We'll try and get some flyers out and stuff, but you be thinking about that because that's coming in July. We're going to have fun. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that you have given us life and breath and that in that life and breath we can praise you. Lord, we pray that you remind us that we are not just dry bones, but that we are here placed by you to praise you. Help us with that, with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says... Amen. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. I wish we would have sang that song before the praise band started because it would have been a really good warm up. Half a step up, half a step down. Next time. Okay, our scripture today is going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. We're going to go through chapter 5, verse 1. And it goes like this. It's written, I believed, therefore I've spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with his with you in his presence all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God therefore we do not lose heart though outwardly we are wasting away yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. This scripture is one that I really have to struggle with because it uh, involves Paul wrestling, shall we say, with the church that he's having difficulty with. And um, sometimes it's easy when you preach out of this passage, you all out there in the congregation might begin to say, pastor got a problem with somebody or is the church causing pastor trouble or you know anything no but to be faithful to the word of the lord uh, when it comes its turn in the lectionary i preach what's before me and so i don't want anybody to think oh man he's sending us a soft message no i'm not everybody take a deep breath it's all okay but this is a tough passage so there we go um I believe that these cracks, these pains, these aches, these everythings that occur in our earthly vessels are how the light of God gets into us. It's how the God breaks through. And so be thankful sometimes when you have a ache, a pain, 
a sorrow, it reminds us that this place, this world, this body is simply temporary. And the eternal stuff, well, that's what we're about to talk about. Growing up, I had a really cool dad, a great dad. And he was a very powerful presence in the community and in the area, in the church, wherever you want to say, my dad had some serious authority. And he also presented very well. He had this, this shock of, of just pure white hair. I've, I've never remembered my dad with any color in his hair. It was always white. I think he was born with white hair. I really do. I saw wedding pictures. It was white. I mean, now granted, they were black and white. But anyway, that doesn't matter. It was this great big shock of white hair. And then he had the bluest eyes that you'd ever want to see. They were ice blue. They were just so cool to see, so cool to see. And if, if you don't believe me, I got lucky. I married a girl with blue eyes, and, and Zach has eyes very close to my dad's. Not quite, not quite as sharp, but close. And uh, so, but he had this presence along with just the appearance of somebody who could have incredible authority. And he had been in the community long enough, and he had earned the respect of enough people that when my dad said, I don't think we should do that, normally the community or whoever would say, yeah, that's right. I, I agree. We shouldn't do that. Or if my dad would say, let's give it a shot, the community normally would go, well, yeah, let's give it a shot. Absolutely. Let's give it a try. And, and so that's what I remember about my dad growing up until right around 14 and 15. And my dad's health began to crack. It's that horrible thing called cancer. And the cracks got larger and larger for him. Now, I'll always remember one day we were out and... and um, I just happened to be riding along with him on the combine. We were shooting the breeze and because I, I drove the truck and sometimes sitting in the hot truck was just depressing. So you'd jump in the combine cab, which was air conditioned, and you know, act like you had something to tell your dad when actually you're just soaking in the AC. But um, he was sitting there and he, he said, hey, we were cutting weed as he did this. He said, hey, look at this. He pulled his hat off. With his other hand, he grabbed out a big old hock of hair. And he said, would you look at that? All I am is a broken vessel. And then he put his hat back on. He died like five months later. Incredible. That quick. That quick. And so we forget that we, when we struggle, when we try to claim power and authority and speak for others and voices and things that we're pretty weak actually and our time here is pretty temporary and that's why it behooves us to look at those inward gifts from God and not strive so hard to be that outward powerful presence that controlling factor that leader, if you will. And so what Paul was struggling with in this passage, and then what we all can struggle with is, sometimes when that powerful presence, that organizing force, that one that gave the direction, that one that stood up front, that one who spoke with authority leaves, there's a vacuum. And nature abhors a vacuum. Nature will fill that vacuum. If you don't spend your time in prayer, if you haven't prepared as a congregation, as a group, as a people, that you are ready if something should happen to one, then you have set yourself up for chaos. And that's what's happening 
in 2 Corinthians. That's what's going on. Paul had left, and in his absence, the people of Corinth, well, their hearts did not grow fonder. Instead, they sought positions of power and authority, and in doing that, they attempted to diminish and minimize Paul and his authority. Don't listen to Paul. Don't, don't bother with him. He's not here. Look at me. And I have the answer. Listen to me. And in that, and in those controls, and in those fights, and in those struggles, and in that wrestling, Paul gets wind of all of this. Paul hears it. And his soul is grieved. How could I have done this so wrong in preaching the word of God and telling them of how Jesus Christ lived and begging them to live like Christ? They got it all wrong. And then instead of serving one another, they're trying to exert power over one another that they're trying to take control instead of helping one another. Paul was grieved. He talked about the painful letter that he sent. It's, it's lost to us. We don't know what he said in the painful letter. He makes reference to it, but he doesn't really explain what he wrote in there. But I'm sure he wrote something about, really? I taught you about Jesus Christ. I taught you about what it means to be a Christian, and this is how you act it out? This is how you play it? I think you've missed the message in completely, totally. And I couldn't be more disappointed in you all. Whew! Wow. And then Paul goes farther. Because obviously the painful letter didn't quite get across the way he thought it would. Paul thought maybe if he could make that one authoritative appeal, appeal to them, they'd fall in line. We know from 2 Corinthians, yeah, they weren't falling in line. And so Paul began to say, I know I'm weak. I know when I came to you, I spoke simply. I know when I came to you, I didn't have the physical appearance of an Adonis, but I spoke with the authority of God. And that authority, despite the cracks that are in my vessel or thorn in the flesh, he would say, despite that, God has not abandoned me. There's this theology it's existed from even before Jesus Christ. And it still continues today and it's dangerous. So I want to warn you about it today. God does not curse you if you're doing wrong. God might not necessarily bless you abundantly if you're doing right. We look on the outward appearance and we think, wow, that guy is rich. God must love him. Remember Job? That guy's got it all. God loves him. We look at someone else. Well, let's say Job a few chapters later. Oh, look at that guy. Cursed by God. Lost his family, lost his farm, lost his wealth, lost his health. That guy's cursed by God. If Job teaches us nothing, and if Paul doesn't try to reinforce this, it's that no, that's an outward thing. That's an outward thing. And instead, what you should be doing is focusing more on what's going on inside yourself. Quit worrying about the guy across the street, down the road, wherever. Worry about yourself. And am I acting out 
the fruits of the Spirit that I'm supposed to act out? Am I a servant? Or am I trying to get over on other people? That's where Paul is going here. That's where Paul is challenging. And though, even though he is weak, and even though he isn't present, he still has the blessing of God. And you better believe it. That's the story for us. There's a story in here for us. And it's that those outward appearances, we all begin to crack. That's how the light of God gets in. That's how the light of God gets in. And in those inward traits is where we should focus, is where we should give our energy. It's where we should try to grow. We don't need to be trying to fix the cracks. There's no need to go to a plastic surgeon here to fix yourself. It's all right. Because the outward appearance is what it is. But we can work on the inside stuff. And so Paul again reminds us in Matthew 27 of just the danger of looking at the outside instead of the in. And so I want to share that, that chapter with you just a little bit. It's after Jesus' arrest. And so Jesus has been arrested, and he's uh, went before Pilate, and he's gone before Pilate, and Pilate has said basically, what would you bring me this guy for? I find no fault in this man. Why, why do I have him? And they're like, oh, he's horrible. He's horrible. Just, just keep him in jail. Well, Pilate, seeing a way out of this, because he knows he has an innocent dude, there's this festival going on. You might know it. It's called Passover. And during this course of the festival, there was a tradition that Pilate, showing how generous he is, even though he has a thousand people in jail for political reasons, uh, during this time he'll let one out because he is nothing if not generous and good and kind and all those other words, you know. Uh, maybe not true, but anyway, um, he's going to let one person out. And so he, he brings Jesus as an option. He has Jesus on the front steps along with this guy called Barabbas. Barabbas. And Barabbas was a, was a zealot and he was a guy who, well, let me try to describe the two, shall we? Um, Jesus, broken down, head down, scrawny, weak, beaten, doesn't look like much. Barabbas, linebacker for the Chicago Bears. Okay? The people look at the two options. Who could possibly save them? The scrawny weakling or the linebacker? Sure, the linebacker had got caught but at least he had got caught trying to overthrow the Roman government. Jesus, what had he done? Knocked a couple tables over and then meekly went with them. Huh, this is an easy choice, is it not? And so the crowd fell for the very tra trap that we've been fallen for since the book of Job. They looked at the outward appearance and they said, give us Barabbas, free him. In their minds, they knew, he'll save us. This Jesus dude is done. He's done. Now think about that in Paul's terms. Paul is making the exact same case of be careful who you look at on the outward appearance. Because even though we can make judgment calls off the outward appearance. What can we not do? See the heart. See the inward. See what's growing behind the cracks. In that is where true strength lies. Because the outward, I, I don't know how to break this to you all. I'm just going to tell you. Barabbas, the linebacker, 
If he got old, he got weak. My guess is he probably tried to overthrow the Roman government again. He probably got dead is what he got. That outward appearance, death. But inward, Paul continues to challenge his church. Church, when people look at this church, what do they see? This is what I hope they see. This is what Paul called the church in Corneth to be. A church filled with grace. As I like to say, hopefully grace abounds. A church filled with thankfulness over salvation. A church that has been justified to the point where they don't worry about themselves, but they serve others. A church that is renewed daily in thankfulness, in grace, in mercy, in truth, and in the big one, love. Love. All this power you have, all this physical ability, and I realize a lot of us in the crowd already know what the physical ability is doing. So, you know, I'm talking to, you know, Jack and Shane and Blake and Brian and, you know, Michael back there and Ben. And, yeah, I'm talking to Skyler. Maybe you still got it. I don't know. It might be fading. But, you know, some of you, you already know what I'm about to say here. That you stuff, it'll go away and it'll crack. But what Paul is encouraging each and every one of you is to look for those things and exercise those things that will never crack. They're good for eternity. And the greatest one is love. That's what he wrote to him the very first time in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He wrote a whole chapter. Just love. Just love. And they didn't. And they didn't. They went for power. They went for outward appearance. They went for the glory of man. And they lost the blessing of God. Today, church, I come before you today and just speak a simple truth to you. Look for what's eternal. Chase what's eternal. Know that these things are what will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And of course, God. Chase God. And God bless you all. Amen. Well, I invite you today. That wasn't too painful, was it? I was talking to Teresa, but I don't know if she got the message or not. So it was one of those. Um, I invite you today, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that again... Today's a good day to start that chase, to chase Christ, to chase God. And so we invite you to come forward as we sing this song. If you'd like to join, uh, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you'd like to join the church, we invite you to come down. If you've done those things, maybe you just want to come down, make a confession, we invite you to do that. Or you can do that right where you stand. And so we invite you to give it to God where maybe you've leaned too, too hard on your pride and your own self, give that to God. Trade it out for the love and peace of God. Let's stand and sing. Steve Pena here. This is for Steve Pena. He loves this song. Majesty, worship his majesty.
Sean hasn't done yet. He wanted to bring a few more up here. You guys can be seated. And so this is, this is Ruth and um, wife. LaShawn's wife. I had a moment there. Sorry. It was one of those. I go, I don't remember what she is. No, it's wife. And so now th this is also LaShawn. All right. And this, I forgot already. Kadame. Am I saying it right? Kadame. So you, there's a test. All right, next week, Kadame and LaShawn, you got it. And so Ruth today has decided that she'd also like to join the church with LaShawn. And so we're excited about that. And so we need to vote, though, so we'll see how it goes today. And um, so church, do you promise to support Ruth and her walk? Whenever she needs someone, you guys will do your very best to be there and that you'll support not only Ruth, but also LaShawn in their walk. And if you do, please say yes. The no's don't matter. You're in, Ruth. Congratulations. All right. Very good. And um, Ruth, you can do the same thing LaShawn did last week. You can stand at the back door if you want, and people will shake your hand. Or you can make them come to you. It's up to you. You've got kids, so you get exemption. All right. Very good. What, what kind of announcements do we have? Well, we have the regular kind of announcements. Oh, good. Uh, I like see. the boring kind. The June loose coin is for coffee for Crazy Faith Street. I'm not supposed to touch that. Save the dates for Vacation Bible School. Oh, getting so excited. We started painting stuff on stuff, and it's going to be great. Um, and shoe boxes are needed. So if, if you bought new shoes, bring your box. And then the OCC group will fill it up. And that's about all. Very good. Very good. Do we have any other announcements from anybody? What? What? What, them? I don't know. You guys want to come forward? Come on. Come on up. I don't know why I'm bringing this couple up. I just don't have any idea why. So, um, you know, if you didn't want me to know, you shouldn't put it on Facebook. <laughs> right? Come on over. Oh, okay. They're surrounding me. No, they're not. All right. I am so excited to share good news with you all today. Or do you guys want to share good news? I can share good news. Very good. And so Blake, Blake has finally made a good decision. He's a smart man. And after being with Allie all this time and, and coming with her all the way from Texas to up here, I saw on Facebook that Blake has asked Allie to be his wife. And it sounds like she said yes. Yes, and so, yay! You did good, you did good. And um, so you guys can look at her ring and make sure he did okay. And he did, I told him this morning, I said, dude, that's a lot of tired, it's changed. <laughs> and so you did good, you did good, all right? We are excited, and so we are. And uh, congratulations, uh, well, no, we won't congratulate them. So what did they have to do with this? And so now your parents were up, right? That was great. Did they go back? They left this morning. They didn't want to come to church. They're too good for us. I understand. I understand. And so um, make sure when you see them all, just give them a congratulation, a hug, and a celebration. It's always good. It's good. All right. Great job. Great job. OK. Good job. I'm also quite thrilled because that means I get to counsel young people, and I just love torturing people. Ah, oh, this will be so good. All right. Um, other than thank you, other than that, if it hadn't been for Evelyn and Ron, you might have got out without having to come forward. If you want somebody to blame, all right. Um, do we have any other announcements? All right. Hearing none, I just want to share the good news with you all: that yes, our earthly vessels they crack. And sometimes they crack with rather large cracks. 
But that light that comes in is God. And God fills the crack. God fills the very space that you are. God loves you. He's always going to be with you. And as chapter 5, verse 1 said, he's built in a place for you. And it's going to be great because it's eternal. God bless you all. Real good. And amen.